Hello, everyone. Scott Sorrell coming to you from the ADSA meetings here in Kansas City. With me today is two distinguished uh, gentlemen from the University of Wisconsin. First, Dr. Billy Brown. Uh, he's a postdoc at University of Wisconsin, but he's uh, recently taking uh, a, a post at Kansas State. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. And Dr. Henry Hodorf, uh, which is, um, he's a newly minted doctor. And after, uh, I don't know when, but soon, he's gonna be going on to a new career with Karina Mills. So gentlemen, welcome. Appreciate uh, you coming by today. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be here. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna be reviewing uh, one oral presentation by Henry and a poster, a related poster uh, that Billy did, uh, the titles of which are Increasing Dose of Postpartum Rumen Protected Choline and the Effects of In Utero Exposure on Angus Holstein Beef Calves, and then uh, one on the effects of in utero, in utero choline exposure on growth and metabolism in weaned Angus and Holstein calves. Correct. All right. Who would like to start? I'd like somebody to give me an overview of. Uh, I'm going to start with your. Yeah, give us an overview of the uh, presentation. Yeah, I can take that, Scott. So, what we were doing was increasing the dose of prepartum ruin protected choline. So, we had a zero, a control, we had our 15 grams, and then about one and a half times 22 grams. So, we're trying to see if, if we feed more ruin protected choline, would we increase some of the established effects on postpartum cows? And we leveraged part of that transition cow experiment to look at potential in utero effects in calves. Uh, some of those calves were Holstein by Angus calves, so it's, it's adult cows that are bred with, with Angus semen. And so what we're trying to figure out is if there are any in utero effects on early life growth and feed efficiency in those calves. And so we, we treated all those animals similarly after growth, so the only difference in, in what they're exposed to is that in utero choline treatment. Very well. And Billy, can you tell us about your poster? Yeah, absolutely. We, we actually took what Henry did and we did an extension of that. We had some really nice funding through the Dairy Innovation Hub at Wisconsin. And uh, we, we had seen in some previous literature that had sparked a lot of what Henry was looking at, that uh, in utero choline could uh, increase average daily gain and growth through about 50 weeks of age in Holstein heifers. And so uh, our, our beef facilities were maybe a little underutilized and we say, hey, we have a really cool opportunity here to leverage some of those things and, and follow them for a longer period of time. So we took monthly measurements of these beef uh, or Angus Holstein crosses that Henry uh, had produced in, in that project and weighed them monthly uh, to get good uh, good weights on them and repeatable weights that we could uh, analyze over a period of time. So we made weigh them monthly through nine months of age. And then we put them on a feed efficiency study. And um, while they were on a finishing diet, we transitioned them to a finishing diet at about eight or nine months of age. And uh, we're able to look at the feed efficiency of them and, and their blood metabolites to see uh, what some of those uh, variables were looking like, like if there was uh, any any response there and and so uh, then from the next stage is uh, we're not quite done with that yet is going all the way out to the finishing phase and, and the slaughter phase and looking at carcass composition so the first cohort has gone to harvest and we have those results and then the second cohort will go soon and and so we're excited to see what is yeah, very there. interesting very interesting my co-host for the session is dr. Glenn Ains technical service manager for Balcom Corporation uh, Glenn do you have any questions one ask about you know the uniqueness of how you actually fed reassure in this particular study, right? Yep. In so, those dams. Yeah. So most of the research in rumen protected choline has been with top dress experiments, where you can target a specific amount of choline for each cow. But the way that we did it is we were trying to mimic how choline is really fed in the industry, and we mixed it into the TMR. And what this means is that the amount of choline that was actually consumed by the cow is dependent on her dry matter intake. So what ended up happening is we have a range in average daily choline intakes from about six to 24 grams per day. Right, and you, some, you can actually lay that out and show linear responses in terms of your data. Yeah, so we, we measured prepartum dry matter intake and from that we could calculate actual choline intakes. And we attempted to use that continuous data as an explanatory variable in some of our responses like average daily gain and feed efficiency. So can you explain how that data can be used or, or to interpret the results? Yeah, so we actually observed that in the male Holstein by Angus calves, we had improved rates of gain from three to eight weeks of age. 
and it actually responded in a linear fashion. So the more choline that her mo that that calf's his mother ate, the greater that average daily gain rate was from three day weeks. Yeah. That's interesting because you said the male calves, but not the female calves. Right. We did not observe effects on average daily gain in those females. Any idea why that would be the case? You know, I'd have to speculate a little bit here because sure. beef genetics aren't my expertise. But <laughs> when we think about males and females, and I think it probably has something to do with biological priorities. I wonder if those males are putting energy towards growth and maybe females are are, are more prioritized with reproduction. That's, that's me speculating a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Because we've seen that, you know, that effect of, of adding reassure in dams diets actually having a, a prolonged effect on heifer growth all the way out to, to calving. Um, so we've seen that benefit, at least on the dairy side. Right, right. And I wonder if in those dairy heifers, you know, we've bred them for stature and milk production, and they seem, you know, to have that genetic drive to grow big. And so I wonder if there's some similarities between genetic priorities between the female Holstein replacements and the male Angus, uh, Angus cross calves. So then after we, we get them weaned, Billy, you, you saw what? What happened uh, after that? Uh, again, we had the unique opportunity to weigh these animals uh, on a regular basis, a monthly basis. And uh, our take home message for that, that there was a tendency uh, for uh, increasing in utero choline dose to uh, increase body weight, hip height, and uh, wither height as well. So there seems to be a little bit of a growth response there, um, which is really interesting. There, there had been previous works e even looking at uh, in utero uh, bone length uh, effects from feeding choline on a, a very small study in sheep. And uh, that showed some similar uh, femur length increases. And so it seems like that's carrying over in, in these calves as well. It's just, just some added growth. And I think that's uh, exciting from the standpoint of a, a dairy farmer that's producing Angus and Holstein cross calves. You know, you want a, a way to be able to add value to those calves uh, immediately right out of the gate because you're selling them on total pounds if you retain ownership of that. And so um, that that's a unique thing that I think probably that's an opportunity to span beyond just the dairy industry into other species as well and, and being able to add value pretty easily. Yeah, and there's a lot of a lot of dairy cows being bred back to, to Angus exactly. these days. So can you ballpark the, the, the difference in growth? Yeah, so it, it was averaged over that period of time. I think uh, what we looked at yesterday was maybe a, a, a 30 pound difference uh, from the control group to the highest uh, dose of choline, which is the 22 grams. Uh, I think so that that is pretty significant uh, yeah. so we'll, we'll be excited to kind of reveal uh, later when we take these last group to harvest if, if that uh, held over in the long run but you know if folks are selling calves off the farm they feed them for a while too I, I think there's an opportunity you know even if it's not in the final finishing phase for folks to garner some some uh, dollars there that's pretty fascinating that you can get a, a response eight ten months down the road in an animal when the dam was just fed something for a few weeks. And, uh, and to me, that's a whole part of this uh, developmental programming area that's becoming a bigger and bigger uh, area of emphasis in animal science research right now. And I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of those things of, of uh, what the, the dam effects are on the offspring. And in the dairy industry, we have the perfect model to be able to evaluate that uh, because con contrary to beef or swine or something like that, where the offspring stays on the dam while they're uh, nursing, you're still having dam effects at that point uh, mm -hmm. for, for postpartum effects, milk production or whatever. We can isolate that in the dairy industry and see. hopefully we can do some really cool things to understand. Yeah. That, that area of epigenomics is, is really quite fascinating. To explain. Yeah. Gentlemen, you're both going to be departing University of Wisconsin here uh, shortly. And so you're not going to be continuing this research. What kind of advice would you give Dr. Heather White for the next step in this kind of research? Well, for me, I'll go ahead and jump in um, for this. I, I think there's an opportunity to uh, to look at why we're we're experiencing some of these growth changes that we have observed, and and that goes for anybody, not just Dr. White as well. You know, trying to understand mechanistically what's going on, and, and that's the hard part, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so that requires taking some more tissue samples and understanding some gene expression in different areas. Um, and it will really require some uh, deeper work than the superficial thing that everybody's doing at this point, just trying to figure out if there is a global effect. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's looking at metabolism. I think it's looking at brain development, gut development, all of those things. If you look at the literature from the rodents and mice, you see some subtle effects there. And I think it's probably carrying over the dairy cattle as well. Ben. Billy summed it up pretty well. Ben. All right, very well. Uh, Dr. Brown, Dr. Holdor, thank you for joining us today. I wish you guys the best of luck in your new careers. Thank you. Appreciate the time today. Thanks for having us, Scott. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at valchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at valchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.